To get started, I think it would be great to you know, start here with Bonnie and really talk about what are some of the things that she does specifically as the VP of Marketing Communications at SAP. Well, thank you, Wayne. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today, and especially for me, um, with a job that has me traveling around the world to actually be in Philadelphia, where I live. Um, so at SAP, we're one of the world's largest software application companies. Um, we actually have our US headquarters here outside of Philadelphia in Newtown Square, but we are based in Germany. Um, SAP is, our purpose is really to help the world run better and to improve people's lives. And to do that, we work across many industries, pretty much any industry you can name, we have software that can help you run better. Um, specifically for the sports industry, we really are looking at how we can leverage our technology to simplify operations of sports leagues and teams, to enhance the fan experience, which we all know in this room is a very important topic, and to improve performance, whether that be on the pitch or whether that be on the ice. It's how do we leverage data and technology to help athletes be at their best. That's great. Um, Brendan, why don't you talk a little bit about Diamond Kinetics and, and share everybody and, and tell everyone what you're holding in your left hand. Uh, thank you for having me and you're kind enough to bring one of our, uh, our early models of our pitch tracker baseballs. Uh, so uh, I'll get into it in a second. So anybody unfamiliar with Diamond Kinetics, we are essentially a baseball and softball uh, technology company and our mission is essentially uh, trying to enhance the uh, development, learning, and uh, training for baseball and softball players across a wide range of a spectrum, from anywhere from, from the youth to all the way up to professional. Um, of course, I'm biased, but I think we have the uh, uh, most complete um, pitch and swing analysis tools out on the market, uh, from our pitch tracker baseball to our swing tracker bat sensor. So essentially what we do is we, um, to give you a uh, short background, we, uh, you guys a short background, uh, we use motion-based motion analytics to provide the hitters uh, and the pitchers with just a complete view of really how the swing works, how throwing the ball does, and then what their strengths and weaknesses are, and most importantly, what adjustments they need to make to take their game to the, to the next level. And I think a really interesting part of our technology company is that you have the same technology used at the major leagues as you do as at the youth level. And you can't say that, I think, about a lot of different technologies. Uh, same with major league hitters using sensors as they are as youth guys. And we have uh, really, uh, really straightforward metrics and easy to understand to help uh, all levels raise their game. Well, I'm excited to, to dig into that, to a lot of the things we just talked about. And, and just, I guess I should say, like, Jim Cramer says at, uh, on, on CNBC is that we're investors in Diamond Kinetics, so um, I'm not sure what else he says, but he says something like that. Anyway, um, Ken, uh, um, you know, look, after being here at Penn for all these years, literally writing the book on, on sports business management, you went out to Arizona, uh, to Arizona State University to run the Global Sport Institute. You know, tell us a little about the Global Sport Institute and, and why did you do it? Last part first, weather? Is that, I mean, is that <laughs> Of course, the weather. <laughs> um, so, so it's about two, two years new, and it is a, a sports research institute focused on uh, making people in sport better, the entities better, and the world better as a result. So it's got that hard uh, social impact kind of presence. And, and think about three different areas that, that we really focus on. The, the first is education, kind of obviously, but education focused on uh, athletes transitioning uh, uh, from the athletic world into the real world. Uh, the, the second space is just research broadly, um, and we fund up to a half million dollars uh, a year uh, various research projects ranging from uh, preventing concussions to diversity issues to do wearables work, is Gatorade better than water, sort of all those sorts of things. Uh, and we will have uh, kind of full speed ahead in the next six months or so, uh, a publication that, that exists now, Global Sport Matters, to push that information out so it is impactful and useful. The, the third area, mo most relevant to the conversation today, is the, the innovation pillar. We do uh, fund new ventures. We do assist new ventures uh, educationally on how to do it. I mean, really think of all you know, these highfalutin uh, venture capitalists here. Think of us as, as more of the, the incubator, starter kind of place, uh, five, ten thousand dollars and competitions that let you get underway or get you to that next level. And maybe more importantly, being an educational institution, we can provide you the educational component to make sure you're doing it right and then 
go to see these guys for, for the bigger dollars. Thank you. Um, Ken, so, you know, look, I, I'd love to have you share with, with the, the audience today, you know, just your view on sports in general and how sports have changed. I mean, talk, you touched on innovation at the end. Certainly that's something that I'd love to, for you to touch on. But, you know, when you first got into the sports world as to where it, where it was and where it is today and where it's going, do you have thoughts and views on, on all of that? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the short uh, kind of way to think about this, I mean, the, the great speaker that, that you know, we've got on board here, David Stern, said years ago, content is king. And I think content is king uh, from both the, the monetary side and, and just you know, what keeps sport going. The, the queen, so we found out, is, is data. That, that whoever controls the data is also going to be a big player in, player in this space, more so than just the casual you know, reading the, the box scores as it was years ago. So that's, that's the big advance that, that's taken place. And, and, the, and the third, I mean, the, the, the person that will uh, really be most successful in sport going forward is the one that figures out how to capture youth to maintain their interest in sport and to shift to whatever sport they, they shift to. I mean, to, if you go back in time again, we were talking with some folks at, at lunch about you know, baseball, longstanding national pastime. Why has that evolved? Will that evolve back again? Will football survive? Will football go the way of boxing? What's going to happen with soccer? Sort of all those kinds of issues. The, the, the answer that you always come to when you talk to all kinds of people involved is it, it's going to be whoever captures the kids. And in the long run, that's, that's where sport's going to go. Well, I have a ton of follow-ups, but we, I, let me, let me, we'll, we'll go down the line here a little bit. Um, Bonnie, um, you know, Ken mentioned data. And certainly at SAP, that's what you do, right? So how has really, how have the, the collection of data, all the data that's now available really accelerated sports in, from, in your perspective? Absolutely. So one thing I think going off of what Ken talked about, SAP has been providing um, the stats for the NBA since 2013. And when you think about the NBA's audience, most of their fans will never step foot in an arena to see a live game. Um, a very large part of the NBA's fan base is outside of the United States. And what we see here is how do we keep them engaged and how do we really monetize that and make sure that they're able to do what they want to do. So it's through our stats page, the interesting thing is this past season, fans went spent 1.6 million hours on the stats page. So there's clearly an appetite for stats, whether it's relatability to foul, follow your favorite player, to be in your own, um, your, you know, winning, winning against your friends in a friendly competition, but data matters. And it's really, it's really something that isn't going away. And people really want to be able to also better relate to the athletes that they love. You know, it, there's bragging rights on the, on the playground. It's, you know, who, you know, what did, what did um, LeBron do this week? What did Steph do? How do we look at all of the data? And what we're finding is a lot of these, a lot of the people who are accessing this are young, young kids. They are students of the game. Um, you know, another area from a stat standpoint that we've done a lot of work with is at Levi's Stadium for the San Francisco 49ers. So when we started working with them, we were talking about the game day experience. And when you think about a traditional NFL season, they only have eight opportunities to engage their fans live in their, in their stadium, unless they make you know, the playoffs and continue the run. And what we did was we actually, working with their data and analytics team, is we created what we now call the executive huddle. So if you will, if you can imagine, there is a suite at the top of the stadium that's field facing, and around that suite are about 20 different LED screens that are tracking real-time data, everything from parking to food and beverage to the bathroom lines to the hot dog cart to see when that hot dog cart needs to be replenished. And we're able to now be able to leverage all of this real-time data to fix anything that's happening that could ruin that fan experience at the stadium. And so it's really interesting when you think about sports, the sports area. I mean, it is a business. And if you use technology the right way, you can really grow your business. Well, as Mike's from the Phillies earlier said, that I liked hot dogs, and if you saw that earlier panel. But I mean, so you can actually tr see all of this data right now. Yeah, it's through sensors. 
I mean, literally, and they talk about the bathroom lines, and I don't know, for, as a female, sometimes the bathroom lines are very unpleasant. And the, the goal was, how do we make sure that we can keep our fans in the seats watching the action? Because the minute they're out of their seats and they're stuck in a line, they're gonna go on social media and complain. That's a bad, that's not the brand value that they want. It's, it's just, it's fascinating. I mean, again, this, one of the things we'll, we'll get into at the, at the end of the conversation is really, you know, as a, as a young person, as a student, as, a, as a, someone who's an aspiring, you know, who wants to work in this industry, just think about all the things that we're, we're talking about right now and the different opportunities that are involved in sports more than ever today. Um, Brendan, you, you know, we talk about data, we talk about, you know, kids and youth and the fact that, you know, you could use as a, th this ball that we were, we were talking about earlier or the swing tracker can be used by a, an eight-year-old baseball or softball player, but that's the exact same thing and the same amount of data and, and, and analytics that you can get from an eight-year-old that you can from a major leaguer. I'd love to talk about that and when... And, and, Certainly, it's, it's democratized player development uh, across uh, all you know all levels, and, and no matter where where you're from or you know or, or what level you're at, and really the uh, use and adoption of technology, and specifically how it relates to kind of data-driven player development, has just exploded in the last five years. And, and interestingly enough, uh, from our perspective, it's been. Uh, almost a, uh, a bottom-up adoption where, you know, until recently there's been a little pushback from, from the old guard in terms of a full, you know, throated adoption of, of technology as it relates to player development. But it's really just given players um, unbelievably more information and in how they can dissect their own performance and ultimately um, make adjustments and improve and, and take their game to the next level. It's also changed the way the teams value and, a certain, and essentially construct their roster. So from, you know, particularly in the pitcher side, where the, the technology has um, advanced, uh, or at least in, in the early stages was more advanced uh, for them from the hitters, but then certainly DK is fighting back and leveling that playing field. It's allowed pitchers to not only analyze what type of pitches that they're having, but also um, pair them with their essentially um, what type of offerings that they make and use whether if you're not using a DK sensor, uh, some uh, four to six thousand uh, dollar high speed cameras that allow you to adjust your your grip and your hand speed uh, to affect the tilt and the spin on a ball so that you make all your pitches look the same but act differently, ultimately increasing your deception and your hopefully your swing and miss rate. And so to give you a little um, peek into what we have in, in development at DK, um, from the hitter's point of view, we're using our swing tracker sensor. And essentially, we're using a 3D view of your swing plane and your swing path. And then we're taking uh, three important elements of your, of your barrel slot, how long it's in the zone, and then your vertical angle and your horizontal angle. And then we're collecting all this data, and then what we're doing is we're spitting back out to you in a more specific way, essentially your swing archetype to your swing fingerprint, which is what we're calling it. And so from there, you can, you can understand what your strengths and weaknesses are and what specifically adjustments you need to make to um, address those weaknesses or simply just stop swinging at those pitches. What if you had that information while you were in the major leagues? How would that have helped you? It certainly would have saved a lot of helmets and broken bats uh, from, from being chucked into why I keep swinging at sinkers down and in and grounding the third. Uh, but, but at the same time, you... you <laughs> Sorry, I went back to a bad place. Uh, Ryan, come on up here. You got to talk. <laughs> help him out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but certainly, uh, information is, is so, uh, the more feedback, it, it shortened the feedback loop significantly from what it used to be. And that is a huge step and a huge advance for, uh, for major leaguers and youth. And, 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 Ryan, and Ryan dealt with the same thing. Certainly, you, you had coaches coming up that gave the same advice to every hitter, depending on what you were doing wrong. Across Watch the, the ball? Board. Watch yeah. the ball? Or, no, I'm kidding. But, yeah. And so, right. And uh, so th this but is a literally, literally you would get hitting coaches that would tell you the same thing to you. You were, you were a righty, right? Right handed batter. So you would talk to a, a righty, a lefty, a, 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 a slugger, a, a singles guy. I mean, that wouldn't matter. Like you, you right. same kind of advice. Yeah, they were telling me to hit down on the ball, just like they were telling Ryan at certain at certain time, points in his career to hit down on the ball. And you know, there's there's no bad hops in the air and this and that. And certainly. All the data, and it was like, but Ryan's fly balls end over the fence, so th there's no bad hops over there either. Uh, but 
So yeah, it's allowed them to personalize player development far more than they used to. Fascinating. Bonnie, I mean, from the, the type of work that you do with, at, at SAP and, and the data that's now you know, uh, looked at and analyzed, how, does it, how are you using it to enhance performance uh, in, in the sports that you're focused on at SAP? Yeah, so one example I can talk about is the WTA, the Women's Tennis Association. So we've been doing all of this, the data and the stats for the WTA, and we've created an on-court on coaching app. So I know that on-court coaching is absolutely a, uh, there's, there's two different sides of the coin here, of the purists who believe that there is no room for technology in coaching, and then those who see it as a way to stay relevant with the younger audience and to make it more of an entertainment value. So many years ago, the WTA made a rule change to allow um, small electronic devices on the court during on-court coaching breaks. And so what we did with SAP was we took all of the data from across all of the players, everything that's coming off of the Hawkeye sensors on the courts during WTA events, and we've created all of it into an app that literally the coaches and the players can look at down to the, if you're playing against um, Serena, 90% of her shots are gonna, uh, when she's serving from this point are gonna fall within these five square meters of the court. You need to move up. And so what we have had here is, you know, traditionally in, in tennis, what was happening before was a coach would be sitting on the sideline while their player was, was hitting, and then they would take a pen and a paper and they would put the dots where they thought they, would, they were. And then when it came down to the conversation between coach and athlete, psychology just went crazy. And the coach is telling the athlete one thing and the athlete's saying, nope, you're wrong, that's not how it worked. And what ended up is now that we have all of this technology, you know, data, the data doesn't lie. So you can actually see where all the balls are hitting and you can, through the technology, you can look at many different ways. We just announced last week the WTA finals in Shenzhen, China. We just announced more of a rally analysis for patterns of play. So now we're able to dive in deeper on based on where the, the patterns are, lefty or righty. There's a million ways to, to, to do the data. But what we see now is it, at the beginning, it was a little bit of a hard sell for some of the coaches. But we realized uh, we were at a, uh, a final match in Miami one year, and it was Sharapova and Serena playing the next day. And both of their coaches came in to, to go through the data. And so the data is also helping a lot of the broadcasters to humanize the game to the fans who are watching. And you know, another really quick example is with the NHL. So this year, on this season, you're gonna see iPads on the bench. So SAP partnered with Apple and we've created an, um, a coaching insights app for the NHL. And this is the first season that it's going to be in, in, in use. And it really is the, you know, Gary Bettman and looking at technology and seeing this as an enabler to grow the sport. So everything from the coaching to eventually the, the discussions around player and puck tracking. I mean, the technology and the data that comes through the tech is just, it's a, it's a treasure chest. It's really fascinating. Both those stories from a tennis perspective, from hockey, baseball, we heard earlier from Davion Ross, from shot tracker as to what's happening with iPads and data in basketball. So Ken, like, it's a lot of data, and if you start talking about, and it also comes to, you know, starts to bring in the idea of privacy and integrity and all these different types of things, and especially on the NCAA side of things. I mean, you start thinking about, you know, who owns this data? Uh, is it the athletes? Is it the schools? Is it the NCAA? Um, are these things some things that you look at or talk about or think about and kind of advise people on, like, what to do? Uh, no, for, for sure. At the, at the highest levels, the, the idea of who owns the data and, and uh, efforts, watch collective bargaining now, that's a big issue in there. Is it, is it the players? Is it, is it management? How is it divided if, if it's monetized? So all, the, all that is, is very important and, and, and key to watch as things move forward. I mean, the, you know, one thing I'm thinking about is everybody's talking about all, all this tech and all these different fancy ways to learn to be a better hitter and do all, all this sorts of stuff. And I mentioned kids, and we were talking about how important it is for kids. I mean, think about the access problem that that creates. If you are not a kid that has access to that, I'm on, on a flight out here, you know, I'm a, in Arizona, why did I go to Arizona? I'm trying to figure out how to golf. So I'm, I'm, I went into one of those rabbit holes watching, you know, golf videos, and they had this super duper device, and the guy says, it's only $75,000. 
I didn't fall for it. I didn't push the button or anything. Adidas will pay for it. <laughs> yeah, but but in the, in the same same vein, yeah, for devices that work. I mean, it was it's the same thing for for kids as it was for me in that moment. That if I can't get to that, then maybe I can't be who I want to be. So I so I think as as all this this tech comes into play and all these you know fancy ways to become a better player come into place. Access is, is really a key piece, and, and again, you, you ask, what are leagues thinking about? What should they be thinking about? If, if, this, if this technology is so important, and you also understand getting kids to continue to play is important and be successful, there's got to be a way to reach communities that don't have the dollars to, to access all these fancy ways to learn to be a better player, rather than just going out to the park and playing. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous point. I mean, it's one of the things that we talked about upstairs, the eSports panel just now, uh, what we just talked about with, with Five Below and Nerd Street, and we were talking about sort of the idea of being able to provide the greatest level of, of equipment and, and competition for all. I mean, that's, that's our goal. Um, and, and that's something that we all care about. It's one of the things we talk about at Diamond Kinetics about being able to get the baseball in the hands of every kid. You know, if you play baseball, you're going to have an opportunity to have a baseball that has, you know, the tech inside of it. And you can try to throw just like Justin Verlander or others and do the best that you can. So the things are, there's things like that that uh, we think are ex extremely important. And when you start thinking about, you know, the analytics, you know, it's, it's certainly the... The, the word of, the, of, of across all of Major League Baseball now, right, Brendan? I mean, and, and how much analytics versus how much feel do you think, you know, things will, will kind of shake out over time and how will, will tech like Diamond Kidex play in all that? So for your, po for your first point about uh, our price point is $100 for a sensor versus 20000 for a hit tracks machine. Uh, so I think we, we, we can allow um, to, to reach uh, the, the kid playing, whether it's in Iowa or New York City, and, and bring that technology uh, to, to every community across the country. So this and, 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 and just from our last board meeting at Diamond Kinetics, our prices are going to drop a lot because of the next generation of sensors and things that we're coming out oh, with. Absolutely. So and even at 99, it's still, t it's still expensive, but we're going to drop that a lot. And to your point about the overuse on, on analytics, I think, and I've been saying this for a while, there's, gonna, there's a market correction coming from the first iteration of Moneyball. The pendulum just swung so far uh, you know, in, in, into the direction of data that it was due, it, it almost made our game predictable and boring at some, uh, on some cases because every team, every manager is reading from the same playbook, so there's no competitive advantage anymore. So now what teams have had to do is they can't find these players, they have to develop them. And so the next, you know, Moneyball point two is, is as I said, tech and, da and uh, data-driven player development. Uh, I think it's going to land in a happy medium. You're seeing uh, locally uh, and, and nationally, you're seeing experience and leadership and the ability to communicate come back in style. You're seeing uh, Joe Girardi being hired as a manager. You're seeing Charlie Manuel be, be, be brought back. I'm probably 100% sure Dusty Baker will probably get another job to manage. And so that, uh, I, I, I think, fine line between ba uh, balancing, as my old manager Joe, Joe Madden used to say, the data and the heartbeat, I think, is, is, is the kind of happy medium. And um, uh, it's, it, it's, it's going to be a good direction uh, coming in the game again. But for any of you out there hoping to not see the shift and not see no bunting and not see relievers in the fourth and fifth inning, every, that's probably here to stay, so I apologize. Um, I, I want to shift gears a little bit, Bonnie, and, and again, we have so many students here. We have so many people that were, you know, are trying to break into this industry who are, you know, I know some people here who are lawyers now who, and, and people who are in other jobs that want to be in the sports business. Um, you know, how do you, what are some of the opportunities today that you're seeing for, for people to, you know, to break in and into this industry? Yeah, so I will, first I will self-declare that um, I did go to school in Ithaca, New York, and my major was sports information and communications. And when I declared my major, my parents basically just wouldn't even talk to me because they said, we're spending all this money to send you to school and you're doing what? So um, I'm proof that you know, if you follow your passions that you can eventually earn your, your keep. And I know that, I believe there's a lot of Temple University students here, yes? Go, go Temple. I um, have a master's degree in journalism, so I was able to combine my communications love with sports. Um, I would say that it is definitely 
the industry is, can seem harder than it actually is, but by your mere attendance here today, you're taking a very good step forward. Um, I would just definitely say you have to really, if you love a sport and you really want to learn more, become a student of that sport. Seek people out. Use online platforms like LinkedIn, even Instagram, and, and I will say Twitter. I know that for the younger people, Twitter is not so exciting, but for many people who have jobs in sports today, Twitter is a big platform. Um, start and engage in the conversations. Ask questions. Um, these are all things that you should be doing, and whenever you have the opportunity to seek experience, even if you're not going to get paid, it's an unfortunate situation in the sports world that people will gladly have you work a lot of hours, and, and they'll give you merch, or they'll give you, a, you know, some kind of signed, you know, something signed by an athlete as, you know, compensation, and it's that's not going to pay your bills. So. If you, aren't, if you are not able to secure your dream job in sports, don't freak out. Get a job somewhere else where you can have translatable skills and still stay in the game and try to, to earn that position. So, I mean, at SAP, it, it's a big software company. Um, I didn't even hear, know what SAP was when I, when I was asked to, to come interview. I had no idea who SAP was. And, you know, I, I talk to students every day at work and I encourage them to volunteer, to send in ideas, especially with social media. I mean, you guys are, you guys are at the cutting edge. You guys were raised with social media and you can teach us what to do. So, I mean, I'm, we always let our social media be led by the younger generation. That's great advice. Ken, I mean, you're, you're a mentor to so many people in the sports industry all across the country and the world. Uh, what are some pieces of advice that you could offer to, to the students and people who want to get into the industry? Make sure you can open the conversation with what you can do that's not, I love sports. That, that, that you've got a, a skill that you can deliver to whoever it is you're talking to that they need. So whether it's marketing, management, accounting, whatever it is, make sure you lead with that and you actually have that skill. And I'll also, also, also say, you know, make, sure you could, you know, make sure you could work at Procter & Gamble. You know, could, could, you, could you sell soap? Could you, could you, uh, could you do the accounting for, for a place like that? So make sure your skills are, are that tight. So beyond that, to me, it's, and, and, and you're the expert on this, I mean, the sports business is, is all about networking and, and getting to know people, making sure people know what it is that you can deliver and being ready for that opportunity because you have that skill. That's great. Brendan, so from your perspective, coming, in, coming into the, the sports business industry, now working for Diamond Kinetics, being a former professional athlete, what kind of advice would you give to other you know, professional athletes who want to get into the business world like you? I, I'd agree uh, on all the points that were just made. In, 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 from my perspective, the network that I had coming out of the game as a player is totally different than the game on the other side of the game, the venture community, they're totally different. So the value of networking and then listening and finding, um, uh, listening strategically on what that person's needs are and then figuring out a way, even if you can't help them, maybe you, you know somebody, you can connect them, and then find a way to create value in that relationship and then follow up and nurture that relationship. I agree with Ken, you're gonna have to uh, build, build the skill set and then um, uh, re requisite to um, creating value in that organization, and then network, 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 and then and be close when, when these opportunities come because they're, they're going to come randomly and it's just going to be, you know, who, who's around that I know that can do this. Well, just maybe briefly give it the example of like what you've done with Major League Baseball with the Tech Summit and the things that you, you created, you know, for them. It, yeah, it was, a, it was a fellow Wharton student that I just kind of reached out to. I wanted to see what his path was. And then as we got talking, he was, um, must have been a little stressed out. He's telling me all the things that were on his plate. And I just kind of drew it out of him. And he said, oh, well, we're trying to put this tech summit together. And then, so I just kind of, I said, unpack that a little bit. Who are, who are you looking to invite? And he, and he uh, said these companies and, and this type of technology that was probably 10 years ago that teams were using. And I was like, you're, you're starting in the wrong direction. I was like, this is what you need to do, this, 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 and then follow up with them, and then literally uh, a, a month later, it's me and two other guys are putting, the whole, putting together the whole thing, and then that's how you know, I got connected with Time Kinetics, was one of the teams there, and, and the whole thing kind of, kind of moved from there. That's awesome, that's awesome. Well, I'd love to, we have a couple more minutes, I'd love to open up for some questions. Are there any questions out there? Oh, great. 
Thank you. So I'm from Temple at the School of Tourism, Sport, Tourism, and Hospi Hospitality Management, and I work for the Sport Industry Research Center. And my question regards is regarding data. How much do you rely on qualitative data versus quantitative data? Because most of you have spent most of the time talking about quantitative, but I want to know what role qualitative data has in your research and work. So maybe I'll take a quick stab at that. I mean, both matter for sure. Um, a lot of when we're looking at stats, you know, the, the market value of it, it's first just to get the stats out there and let people dissect it the way they need to. I think when you look at any given stat, there's a lot of different connotations to that stat. And unless you have the, you know, the database in the background, it's, it's surface level. Um, but definitely, you know, at SAP, we're really looking at, you know, trying to understand what's beneath the data. So, you know, the, this, you know, the, the stats only give you so much, but where do you find like the patterns of the data that could lead you in a different direction to say, okay, maybe if we shift to this model, we'll be able to do this because based on what the data is telling us. So that's, that's kind of how we look at it holistically. And a lot of the, the leagues and clubs that we work with, they really want to analyze all sorts of data and they want to see how it, everything from the way they operate to the way they perform to the way that they're engaging with their fans. Uh, I, I would say, oh, go ahead, sorry. There you go, you go. No, I, I was just going to say, in, in relative to the tech and data-driven uh, player development, a lot of times you'll see things that are going to solve every problem, and they're not feasible, and they just can't crack into some, some of these, uh, specifically if they're selling to a major league team, some of these routines that these athletes have are really tough to crack into, and they've been building them for a long time, and if they were to totally disrupt that, um, then, then it's, just, it's just not going to be feasible. The data is not going to be consistent, and you're ultimately not going to get any draw any insights from it. Uh, my name is Hunter Tabs. I'm a freshman from Temple University. So my question is for Brendan. Um, with the rise in um, home runs in the MLB this year, and specifically the decline in home runs in the postseason, specifically the juice ball and the unjuice ball. How does that affect the data that you collect and how you transcribe it to your um, people who use your the technology baseballs? So the ball, uh, the ball was used, if, if anybody wasn't sure, uh, Major League Baseball bought Rawlings and then magically uh, the ball composition changed a little bit and it was used in the major leagues and then they finally applied it to the minor leagues. And then shockingly, home runs in AAA went up 60%. So, from our standpoint, it hasn't really affected the data we're collecting in terms of the metrics coming off the ball. We all kind of consider them consider them the same. But but moving forward, it could be you know a factor that we're going to have to account for. We have a question back here. Yes, my question is. Um, oh, my name is Saul Frankel. And my question um, for you, all three of you are, I think someone mentioned that earlier, 10 years ago or something, the BlackBerry was the, the number one phone. So I hope all of your companies and everything you guys do get very successful, make a lot of money. But in 10 years, is there going to be new technology? Is, is there going to be something next that might be, I don't want to say better, but newer than what you guys are doing now? And can you predict that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm the last guy drawn on a blackboard. I mean, I mean I'm the last guy looking for a whiteboard. I mean, everybody else is using, you know, so, so it's, it's going to happen. I mean, and we don't know what, what it's going to be. And, and the idea, when, you know, when I said that the idea of content and data kind of moving ahead as kind of the, the, the big leaders as opposed to, you know, butts and seats in the 50s, uh, you know, we don't, we don't know what, what it's going to be. We don't know what the delivery is going to be in terms of, of where the content is, is going to come through. We don't know what the data is going to be used for. So, yeah, for sure, 10 years from now, it's going to be something different. And if you had a BlackBerry 10 years ago, I think you were, you were a little tardy then, I, th I think. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'd say in, in baseball, the only thing we may be concerned about is, is some of the high-speed cameras being able to do what we do. But as it is now, uh, they, they, the high-speed cameras can do some great things, but one thing they can't do is track the bat path and, and get into as granular detail as we can with how the ball's coming off the bat. So I think in the future, you're going to see more integration of those two things. And so 
um, so we can break down and, and get into a little bit more of, of not only how the bat is moving in, in, in the swing path, uh, but also how the body is moving in concert, I think, is, is what's coming next. And then, um, you know, use, use some uh, AI to be able to spit out specific feedback in a much quicker way. Yeah, just to add to that, I would say that, you know, a lot of the areas where the biggest innovation is, is on like player health and safety. Um, and obviously with, with, you know, privacy concerns and things like that, it may not be mainstream as far as way it gets communicated. Um, you know, we're, there, there are some leagues that are looking at for women having a sensor in the sports bra, which is closest to their heart so that they can track in real time, you know, their biometrics. Um, these, these things eventually may go into practice. Um, so I think that it's technology, when it enables, it's great, but when it inhibits, it's also something that is to be, you know, really managed carefully. Uh, hi, my name is um, Andrew, and I have a question for Brendan. Uh, so it's my understanding that uh, bat sensors are used in minor league games, but not major league games at this point? Correct. You know, do you have um, a time frame in mind for when Major League Baseball might adapt uh, sensors? And the second part of my question is, if right now you could only use sensors in practice for Major League, how could that data be different than data taken during uh, real games? So it's a good question. I think uh, it was only approved for minor league games in, in 2018, and it's been a success, and it's done really well. And there is a difference, and, and Ryan can tell you this, your, your BP swing from your game swing, um, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of subtle differences. And so that has been extremely valuable to the development of a lot of these minor league teams, and they've re really liked that. How, how soon uh, the major league does it, I, I, could, I could say probably within probably three years, I would say. Um, but it could be sooner, it could be later. I, I, I thought the uh, the robo ump was was way in the future, and then it just got approved for for certain minor league uh, stadiums uh, next year. So uh, so who knows? Another question. I see one. I see one. Uh, I I have another question. Um, let me come back up. Um, you know, I think one of the things I wanted to to touch on um, before we we wrapped up um, was what are, what are you sort of you know it's kind of like what Saul mentioned earlier sort of like what's the future but what are some of the things that you're most excited about what's coming down the path you know that, that what you potentially will really truly change the game in, in the future is there anything specific that you think of uh, certainly the adoption that we're getting at this tech savvy information hungry youth and so we're collecting about 10 million data points and uh, from uh, pitchers and or from mainly from hitters but for pitchers as well and uh, from on, on our youth circuit and then uh, as you said it's been given adoption and, and widely adopted among major league teams at the minor league level and some guys are using it at the major league level and I think the more data we can collect, the more answers we're going to be able to give. I'm also excited about, as, as you were saying, the potential to kind of uh, lower the price point and, and really uh, democratize uh, development across and create an impact for as many players at, in as many different places as possible. Ken, I, I, would, I would want one question for you. I mean, it's really tied into the light just went off. I don't know if that means we're done. But... Um, Anyway, the, uh, the, the, qu the question I wanted to, to pose to you is if, how do you feel about this statement? I, m I mentioned earlier that Michael Rubin from Fanatics, who's a, who's a friend of many of ours here, you know, talked about the last 10 years was all about e-commerce and the next 10 years are all about sports and the innovation and the opportunities in and around sports. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? How much money does he have? Uh, I mean, I, 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 don't, I, I don't think it's, I mean, e-commerce continues to dominate. I, th I think you know, however we characterize e-commerce, but, but I think, and, and maybe what he meant more is sport has, to, sport has to pick up the pace, and sport has to pick up the pace for all the reasons we were talking about in terms of, of fan interest, because in the end, if that's not there, all this other stuff is, is less valuable. So... Uh, so, so the pace will pick up and the focus on sport imp improvement. I mean, you know, I was going to answer your, your question about, you know, what's 
you know, what's the big, the big next? And we've always talked about what's going to be the first truly global sports league. A lot of people argue that it exists already. But really, what, what's it going to be in is, is technology and t uh, tra speed of travel. And every time somebody talks about London or we hear about what's happening in China, well, how do you connect it all up? I mean, that, that to me is, is technology, uh, travel, and, and the future overall. Lights back. The light. right. No, but you know you're you're right about you know the sort of a global league, and you have you're going to have something now with the Overwatch League, right? Starting in January, where you're going to have a home and away games in the Overwatch League all across the world, and that's something that is is new and exciting. And you know, I, I thought we were going to get through this panel without talking about esports, but there you go. Um, and I know that SCP is involved in the esports as well. Yeah, so SCP has a partnership with Team Liquid and. We've done it, for, we, we went into this few few reasons why. The first was curiosity. Um, you can't ignore what's happening in the esports landscape. And as one of the largest software companies, of course, we had interest. So we had interest for two reasons. Um, one was to see how we can use data and analytics to enhance the in-game experience for the players. And the second one was, we're a tech company, and if we're gonna recruit people, we want these people to come work for SAP. So we looked at it from a purely HR recruitment standpoint, and it was a really perfect storm. So it's, it's still very new for us, but we are doing some in-game analytics um, for the athletes when they're, when they're making decisions during the game of being able to, to hone in on making some recommendations based on the data. So um, it's just amazing, though, when you can go into a giant arena in Europe and it's filled with rabid fans, uh, and it's, you know, people on computers. It's just so bizarre, you know, for, for people who like traditional sports. But I mean, definitely um, eSports is here to stay and it, I, I think it, re it definitely relates well to the younger audience. You know, uh, to, to wrap up, I, I wanna really just touch on one thing, Ken, with you. I mean, this whole um, trend now where athletes are thinking about themselves as entrepreneurs, athletes thinking about themselves as investors, like Ryan, like what Brendan's doing like what Steph, LeBron, Kobe, Magic have done. Um, what, what do you think about this whole trend? What, do you, what, are you sort of, what are your thoughts around everything that's happening in that world? One, one of the things we're doing at, at the Institute is, is looking at that ex exact question because I mean, the, the truth of the matter is, and one reason why, and it's because of who they are, we hear about them more, there, there are some failures. Everybody's not an entrepreneur. So it's, it's, it becomes kind of the the locker room thing, it's what's most visual. I mean, some, some men and women should be, you know, the regional manager for Home Depot, should, should aspire to do something different. To, to, I've got 30, 40 more years to go, I should get a job, just, just like many of us that just don't have the entrepreneur mentality. So I think a, a lot of the, the work that needs to be done is helping, helping men and women as they transition to understand uh, it's okay to try it out, it's okay for all of us that have not been athletes and had kind of eight, 10, 20 year careers, we've been on the, the career journey and failed and tried different stuff, uh, but we gotta find ways to, to allow athletes to do that and not have to hit the home run as an entrepreneur. But, but those that wanna be entrepreneurs and can pull it off should of course continue to do it. That's great. Well, I just wanna thank the panel and thank Bonnie, Brendan, um, and, and Ken.